Welcome to Medical Matters Weekly with Dr. Trey Dobson, presented by Southwestern Vermont Healthcare and Catamount Access Television. Welcome, everyone. Today is May 16th, 2022, and we are recording this show for our May 18th uh, um, presentation. I'm Trey Dobson, Chief Medical Officer at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center and an emergency medicine physician with Dartmouth Health. And this is Medical Matters Weekly, a show about the aspects of healthcare that matter to you most. And I'm excited. My guest today is Dr. Teresa Malcolm, who likes to go by Terry. Is that right, Terry? That's correct. Yes. The Vice President of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging at Dartmouth Health, which is a new position. Um, you've been in the position now for just a few weeks. Is that right? That's right. I am officially six weeks old and starting my seventh week this week. That is fantastic. And you're still relocating, we were talking about. So where are you now? I'm in Arizona, specifically Scottsdale, Arizona. It's where it's where I'm from. And so I'm, I'm in the desert right now. In the desert. That's great. Well, it's actually raining here right now, which is uh, and a little bit cooler, but it will warm up. Teresa served uh, as recently as the chief executive officer at the coaching firm Master Physician Leaders. I actually want to ask you about that in a little bit because that's really cool. Uh, certified by the Physician Coaching Institute and as a professional certified coach by International Coaching Federation, was the chief medical officer at Banner Health in Phoenix, Arizona from about 2016 to 2019, earned her medical degree at Tulane University of Medicine. Hey, I have a lot of friends that went to Tulane, so maybe we can name drop after this. That would be great. And then earned her MBA at Grand Canyon University. I assume not at the same time. That was uh, after medical school. Yes, it was. That was a little little later down the road. All right. Well, thank you, Terry. So tell us a little bit. First off, we'd love to get to know you a little bit. Um, first off, I'm excited also because this is our first chance of, of meeting and I'm in the emergency department at uh, Dartmouth Health on the weekend. So, you know, I may run into you there um, or just during the week when visiting or we'd love to have you come down to Southwestern Vermont Medical Center, you know, where we have our relationship with Dartmouth Health. So tell us a little bit about you and where you're from. Well, as I said earlier, I, I'm from Arizona, so I kind of like to think of myself as a unicorn in that sense, because most people that live in Arizona are not from Arizona, but I was, was born here, call it home, and right after I finished high school, my parents actually moved back. We did live in Sacramento for, for a little while up, up north in California. But my dad had always been wanting to get back to Arizona and had a great job opportunity. And so this has been home for, for many, many years. And it's where our kids were born and it's where we've been raising our children now for years. Um, my background, clinical background is as an OBGYN. And I did know very early on that I wanted to be a physician as early as six. I, I knew that wow. my, my, um, my aunt, my aunt Belle, was a nurse at the local hospital in Georgia. My, my mom's side of the family is from rural Georgia, Keysville, Georgia. And my, my Aunt Belle came home from work one day and saw me sitting and reading. I could always be found with a book. And she said that I reminded her of the doctors that she worked with at the hospital. She said they were always oh. engaged in reading and then they loved to come and teach. They loved to come and share what they had learned after, from their readings. And she said that my, my demeanor, my interest in constantly learning, my desire to share those learnings with others made her think of me as a doctor. And so that was a, a, a seed planted in my head very, very early on and it stuck. I just did not let it go. And as I got older and I was introduced more into the sciences, it just seemed like this perfect combination of teaching and learning and the sciences and helping others to heal and lead healthier lives. So I knew early on, I wanted to be a doctor, was very much on that pathway, on that pre-medical track, went on to UC, um, UC San Diego in La Jolla, California, and then, as you said, medical school mm -hmm. at, at Tulane. And then my OBGYN residency, I finished in the Phoenix area. And what attracted you to OBGYN? I loved the, speaking of diversity, I love the diversity really of the, the patients that I got to treat and the ability to take care of women during their reproductive 
years and well beyond. So I had patients that were as young as nine, all the way up to the age of 92. And so I just loved that the patients were so focused on taking care of themselves, leading healthier lives that I got to engage with women during some of the most critical times during their life and share important milestones with them. That I got to be with women when they were thinking about becoming pregnant, when they did become pregnant, I got to deliver multiple children within their family. I could then got to take care of some of those young children that I actually was there to be able to, to deliver and take care of the women that were important in their lives, their mothers, their grandmothers, their sisters. And so just being able to share and engage with, with women during such a critical time of their lives was really special for me. That's great. You know, I think most people in the audience know this, but if they don't, um, they might think of OBGYN as, as not diverse, but it's actually incredibly diverse. Like you said, not only the ages, but the physiology is diverse. And then the pathophysiology is diverse. Infectious disease, you know, the HIV aspects. Um, I had the benefit of being emergency physician, so I get to see all of that. But plus, my father is still a practicing OBGYN. So he, uh, you know, he's instilled that to me. Uh, since I was very young. Um, and that diversity is, is very prevalent. Uh, disease diversity, as well as physiology diversity in, in OBGYN. And it's, a, it's an attractive field for that. So then how did you move towards leadership and, and diversity um, you know, outside of the practice of OBGYN? You know, it's really always been a focus of mine. I, I didn't naturally consider myself a leader and a lot of times just in working with physicians. I'm not sure if that's something we always think of when we think about right. ourselves. Right. Um, you know, it, it wouldn't be the very first title that I would put next to my name if you asked me, okay, describe yourself. But the more that I, you know, was engaging with others and moving into various positions, I realized it's leadership is so not about the title. It really is about a mindset. And it's really about that belief that you are there to empower others, to help others in unleashing their talents and unleashing their strengths so that they really can lead themselves and then help in, even in, in leading others. And so I was, I was always focused on that. I was always wanting to help people to see the best in themselves and really capitalize on their strengths and their talents so that they could be in service to others. And, and from a diversity standpoint, you know, diversity is not just, uh, it's just, it's not just one component. There's so many different aspects to diversity. There's racial and ethnic diversity. There's sexual diversity. Um, there's neurodiverse diversity. So there's so many different aspects of diversity. And I think one of the, um, one of the areas that I saw as, as I was moving through, throughout my whole journey was I did not see as many people that looked like me. And so I, you know, one, I was always very focused in wanting there to be more women present, more women in, in the room. And we have seen tremendous gains as far as gender equity. We have not experienced as many gains with regards to racial and ethnic equity. And so I also wanted to really focus on how can there be more people of different backgrounds, of di different ethnicities, of different cultural beliefs, of different abilities, all gathered together, sharing their ideas, sharing their strengths together, because we know that when diversity is truly unleashed, we are more creative, we're more innovative, our profits increase. So the more that we can invite others and invite difference, knowing that difference is a good thing and we embrace those differences, then it makes us even better than we could have been from the beginning if we just did it by ourselves. So I was just always really interested in wanting to see more people of different backgrounds coming together to work on the same thing. You know, I love what you were saying. So let me go see if I can go all the way back for a second. When on leadership, um, you know, I, I think about often if I ask a short term leader or an unsuccessful leader, you know, what does it mean to be a leader? They say, you know, to direct others to do things, which, of course, is not what uh, is a hallmark of a good leader. A, a good leader inspires and motivates, helps guide and provide experience, but mostly inspires and motivates uh, others to come up with um, solutions to problems that the leader wasn't even you know, thinking of, or, or, you know, even recognizes that's not their role. It, the role is to motivate and inspire others. 
And then separately, when you're talking about diversity, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. In fact, sometimes I say the opposite. Uh, if a business or a hospital system or uh, you know a school system is not diverse, then by definition, it's going to be stagnant and it's eventually going to fail uh, because the ideas are going to be myopic uh, rather than diverse. You know, hence it's it's word. Speaking of that, I'm kind of going offline here, but I think one of the biggest struggles we have um, here is the a lack of geographic diversity, or I should say that the, the geography inhibits some of the diversities. It's a lot of goodwill among um, uh, health and education uh, to expand and, and to become diverse, but then we're, we're sort of stuck with a geography that is not that way. And that's just gonna be a, a challenge for us. And, we, and I bring it out to be transparent and say, um, that's gonna be a problem, whether we're at you know, Dartmouth-Hitchcock or anywhere really in New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, New England, um, that's a big problem, which we're not going to solve tomorrow, unfortunately. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And one of the things that I am really proud about in being part of Dartmouth Health is their willingness to think differently. And so recognizing this is a challenge in terms of the geography, and we have a number of people who have been part of the Dartmouth Health System for many years and very seasoned, very tenured. And so what can we do to even attract more talent to the area and to just even being able to offer remote work possibilities and opportunities so that we can capitalize on a lot of those talents and those gifts that might exist and that we just know exist. We know they exist in other parts of the country. We know that they exist in other parts of the world and not just limiting people to sharing their gifts and their talents on site that there's so many different ways that we can tap into one another's capabilities and work together. Absolutely, that's great you say that. It's much better than I did. So what do you think, um, and you may have already just said this, but what do you think are the hallmarks of a truly diverse, equitable, and inclusive environment? Yeah, uh, there's so many different aspects to that, but I think one is really embedded into the organization. It's really diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging becomes embedded into the organization's mission. It's part of their vision. It's part of their values. It really becomes um, just essential to its daily operations and it's incorporated into its strategic uh, business objectives. It's, it's not just put off in its own silo. It's not something that is a nice to have, but it's a something that is considered essential to the daily operations of, of the business. Um, I, you know, I think it's also important that we have the ability to be able to measure and to track our successes as well as our failures. We know that this is going to be a long ongoing, ongoing journey. There's gonna be a lot of work to be done. And so we have to have a, um, a measuring and tracking system such that we can see where we're making improvements, where we can, where the progress is happening, where we need to pivot or where we need to shift and, and what are some of the aspects that we actually need to retire, that we need to let go of, those things that are no longer serving us in terms of what our overall uh, goals and what our ultimate vision really is. You know, having that leadership support is is also so important that, you know, the senior leadership team and I feel so wonderful to be partnered together with Joanne, with Dr. Conroy, that she is somebody who has really embraced the importance of diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging and that we have a board, our board of trustees is also advocating for this and that they, everyone wants to be allies in this work and really working together. So without that kind of leadership support, it makes it very difficult to get the kind of momentum and traction that we really need around this. And I, and I, you know, just as one final point, and I said, and I know that there's so many aspects to this, I can't overemphasize enough about how much this is everybody's responsibility. Mm -hmm. I, I'm so excited that this position has been created and that I'm here to help in being you know, a leader and help in putting together that strategic roadmap that we're gonna be following. But this is not my work alone. This is not the work of the office alone. This is the work for all of us that we can work together. And I really want and hope that everyone sees the place for them in this and that whatever you're bringing to the table is going to make it even better. 
right? It has to be a fabric of the culture. And we can look back. I love what you're talking about with when you're mentioning measurement, um, because it, we, we can't be afraid to uh, make mistakes. And we can't be afraid, like you said, to pull back when saying, hey, this isn't working. But that's the same thing we went through in medicine with uh, safety and bringing that in. We had to first off have the awareness. And then second, we had to make it a culture. We're still working on it, but we've made some gains. And the same with um, you know, patient engagement, patient involvement in, in um, what goes on in medicine, making sure they are a part of that decision-making process. That didn't used to be in place. So we had to get that awareness and we had to measure it and we had to come up with ways uh, to improve it. So, um, well, yeah, and, I, you're, and you're so right too. It's not just your office. You can't come wave a magic wand and make uh, everything diverse and make everyone understand that. Um, so I think everyone will be working. There is a good, you know, there is much more of awareness I feel than there was 10 years ago. And I think there's a strong willingness so that, that, that at least puts us at a certain level to start with. And then we can keep, keep working on it. What do you see? I, you know, I put this in one of the questions uh, earlier. What are the hidden costs or less well understood drawbacks of a, of a traditional environment in healthcare, which is mostly has been male dominated, white male dominated um, we talked a little bit about uh, that can cause stagnant um, and, and, and it impedes growth, but can you speak a little bit more to that? Well, I, th I think that, um, you know, one of the challenges that healthcare systems uh, are experiencing nationwide is, is retention. Right. We're, we're seeing a lot of our healthcare workers and professionals leave the practice of medicine altogether. So just from a physician standpoint, one out of five physicians is considering leaving practice, right? They're considering leaving the practice of medicine. We know that our nursing professionals are also strongly considering leaving and have left. Many have left and are in, you know, largely in part from what happened during these past two and a half years during the pandemic. We just know that moral injury burnout has was an ep at epidemic levels prior and the pandemic just really, you know, took that to a whole nother level. But we're really at an existential crisis right now when it comes to having adequate staffing to provide the care that's necessary for our patients to heal, to take, the, to provide the kind of world class care that you know Dartmouth prides itself on of really, of really offering and providing. So we we've been able to go a very long way because healthcare professionals are so resilient. We are the most resilient individuals, you know, really when you look at comparing industry to industry. So we know that we can persevere. We will roll up our sleeves. We will go the extra mile, but to what endpoint, right? And what is the sacrifice at the end? We're sacrificing ourselves. We're so sacrificing our own um, physical, mental, spiritual, emotional well-being. And so if we don't start taking better care of our people, if we don't start taking better care of our healthcare professionals and of our staff and of the people who are helping to keep this place running, we won't have any people in the long run to take care of, right. of our patients, right? Our patients will come need, in need of care and who will really be there to take care of them? Or it'll be someone who's not at their best because they're just so exhausted from what they've already been giving, giving for so long. So I think that really when we look at those hidden costs, it's what is what are we putting at risk by not investing in our people right now? And we're, what we're putting at risk is the health and the well-being of our own people. Yeah, absolutely. You know, what I hear so often um, is people sort of lamenting about the past and they say, you know, well, in the past, uh, you know, we would work 90 hours a week and no one would complain. It's like, well, th that was a problem. I mean, that's clearly a problem. And in the past, we were not diverse. And that's clearly a problem. And so um, when people talk about the past, I hope that they're really saying, look at what we did wrong in the past and how do we learn from that? And, and move forward in ways that better support 
our, our work staff. And I think also people get concerned that we're going to do things that don't make any sense. Of course, we're going to be reasonable. We're always going to work hard in our fields to try to help patients and fulfill the mission of the hospital. Uh, but we do so in a way that is uh, much better for, like you said, resilience and our, our longevity. Uh, or else we will wind up with a broken system for sure. And, and we're, again, we're so excited to be working with you and can't wait to have you down to this part of, of Vermont, but also throughout the, the whole system. I'm gonna read a, a quote from uh, Joanne Conroy, who you just mentioned, the CEO and president of Dartmouth Health. Uh, she says that you specifically, Terry, are tasked with developing and leading an interdisciplinary and cross-departmental office and be responsible for integrating diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging values into all aspects of Dartmouth's health's culture, goals, metrics, and strategic operating plan. That sounds like a mission for an entire organization, not just uh, an individual or an office. I, I couldn't agree I more. Yeah, exactly. I really think that that's exactly her point is that, um, that this is the work of all of us. So I think, you know, we, it's important to have a person, a person who's still charged with this work, but I'm not charged in doing this alone. I'm just, I'm charged with really creating and, and supporting the environment that allows for this, for this work to get done. You know, I just wanted to go back to a point that you made earlier about some of the challenges with this, this work moving, moving forward and, and, and maybe you know we have people today who are lamenting about the past and wishing it could be as it once was. This work is done with great intention. Right. So this this is not random. This is you know just not something that just you know feels good. This isn't just going with your gut. There is tremendous evidence and research to back up that companies that are more diverse that have inclusion as one of its core values perform better. And so, and even the work that we're putting forth is done with such intention and it's done in collaboration with the other leaders of this organization. So this is being co-created. This is not just, just Terry's idea or Terry's work. I'm, I may have this role, but I really see my, my position is to be more of a facilitator, to be more like a conductor. So even if the conductor is not there, the music can still play. And all the members of the orchestra still know what their roles are and they can still create great harmony, but there's a conductor there that's just kind of helping to weave it all together. And that's really what I see that my role is, is that we're all going to come and play our instrument and play our instrument to the best of our ability. And I'm here for us to just co-create beautiful harmony that creates um, you know, just a more inclusive work environment for us. I love that. And I love how you, first of all, I love that analogy because I, I love analogies myself and I'm terrible at them. I give these analogies that people are just like, huh, what does that mean? Um, but when you talk about collaboration, uh, um, I see, you know, working with quality safety value to help on the measurement component and, and HR to work on some of the implementation. And then, like you said, everyone uh, to be motivated, inspired to be innovative on how we can improve this. And you're right on the, um, of course you're right, but on the, on the aspect of uh, the evidence behind it, you know, it's the, and you mentioned this earlier, it's, it's not only being more successful in the ways we think of a business like financial success, but which is true, more of a financial success, but also just the work culture and work environment, people are happier. And if you're happier at work, uh, the outcomes are always going to be better. You're going to perform better. People are going to have uh, greater, um, uh, they're going to stay in their positions for much longer and, and you grow and be successful. And again, the, those that don't just become stagnant and, and fall to the wayside. So in addition to all of this um, work, and we've kind of gone over this, but you have this uh, experience in position leadership. Can you tell us a lesson that you've learned uh, that you would like to, to tell the audience or what you do when you work with others uh, who are physician leaders? Yeah, you're right. We have kind of touched on this a little bit. And so I, I think probably two things that I try to always uh, remind my clients in, in working with them is that one, you have permission to fail and it's, it's absolutely okay to fail. And your, um, your, your mark of success is not going to come just from all of the accomplishments or the wins. And you have many, you have so many that we probably can't even count them all, but it's really gonna be more about how did you respond to a setback? 
that's more what people are going to remember is how did you how did you respond to a setback? What did you learn from the setback? The, your your failures are an opportunity to shift and to change and to improve and to do even better than you did before. And secondly, I like to give everybody just permission to feel just to get it really in touch with your emotional self that we are human beings, not human doings. We can do a lot. You are capable of so much and you have done so much, but to also listen to your inner leader because your inner leader is very smart, is very strong, is very courageous. And so all of those emotions that you are having are perfectly normal. I know when in my training, it was not, it was not encouraged to feel. It was not necessarily normal to feel, even though we all do, but we just don't talk about it. So I just really want to, I always encourage my clients to listen to their emotional selves because that's a place of, of knowing. It's a place of great strength and you can absolutely draw from that. Oh boy, that's a great way to finish up here. And we can't wait to have you back, Terry. Uh, tell us just real quickly, what are you looking forward to over the next year or two professionally and personally? First off, I'm sure it's moving and getting settled uh, in the Northeast. Yes, yes, that's a, that's absolutely one of the things I'm looking forward to. I'm also really looking forward to getting to know more people within the organization. You know, I've really been on a on a listening tour and just listening to what some of the real challenges are, what some of the real pain points are, um, and it's I'm really excited about harnessing all of this energy, all of this enthusiasm that is present right now in this organization about this role, about me joining. And, you know, when I think about, did I, uh, about helping to co-lead a place of, a place of belonging, I feel like I belong here just because of how I have so been welcomed and have felt valued and have felt connected to this organization. So I'm really looking forward to us accomplishing some of those goals that we said that we, we were gonna set out to do. And from one year, from now, looking back and congratulating ourselves and continuing to look ahead at what more is to come. Dr. Terry Malcolm, obstetrician, gynecologist, thank you so much for joining us on our show. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I'll also thank uh, Mike Cutler from CAT TV, Ray Smith from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare, Ashley Jowett from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare. I'm Trey Dobson. Go out and find joy in everything you do, even in the face of adversity, and we will see you next week.